Welcome to the suburbs with Andy and Greg. So tell me, how many years did you do open mics? I did open mics for three years. And then um, the job that I was working came to an end. They went out of business. That's how terrible I was. No, it, it was owned by the Kmart Corporation, and they cl they decided we're we're done with this division. Mm. We're we're quitting. So you can either move to Detroit and work in a Kmart. <laughs> Blue light special. Yeah, why? I, I I'm pretty sure you have Kmart's all over the place. Why are you moving me to Detroit? And that would be a no for me. Not Detroit. <laughs> that would be a no. So, um, which is where Jeff Foxworthy came up with the idea of you may be a redneck if. Oh, it, really? It was at a comedy club in, yeah, in, in the suburbs of Detroit, Chaplin's mm. Comedy Club. Chaplin's Comedy Club in this, and I don't know if it was a Livonia, I can't remember which suburb they were in. Um, it was a building that had a comedy club and a bowling alley that valet parked. Comedy club and a bowling alley. Wow. Yeah, in the same building. And so, and and Foxworthy made some comment like, man, you know, you've made it as a redneck if, if, you, if, <laughs> if you go to a bowling alley that valet parks. And the rest is history. Wow. So, um, so I opted out of the Blue Light special career and uh, decided, well, it's now or never. And so I did some odd jobs until I could fill my schedule with enough uh, club work to make a living at it you know you stuck with it and yeah. obviously a bad comedian's not going to make it no matter how hard they try it's inevitable you're going to have to realize this ain't for me well the thing is about it though that makes it hard good or bad is that booking agents at the time it's back to the booking agents and i know that they have a bad name in the in every probably industry that there is and so these agents, like there's a guy that booked the Funny Bone in Milwaukee. He, There were Funny Bones all over the place. You could do nothing but work the Funny Bone if you were in with Mitch Kutash and Jeff Schneider. Mitch Kutash and Jeff Schneider were, they, they were a comedy duo that ended up not being funny enough to make it, but they understood that comedy was going to be big, and so they started the Funny Bone. They ended up like having two different ideas on the way that those clubs should be run. And so Jeff ended up, he's like, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. So he got Milwaukee and Pittsburgh and Kutash had the rest of the world. He, he probably opened 40 of them. I don't even know. Yeah, it was the, the first franchise for sure. Uh, yeah, probably. There, there were, and then there were other franchises yeah, around. Yeah, the one that sticks in my mind is the first known entity as a franchise. Right. And so Jeff, if you could get through the gruffness, was was very fair. But he was, um, he he. I would call him, and I'd and he'd book me, or he would say there was one time where I, I called him, and he goes, "I don't have time for your minuscule career right now." <laughs> said that those very words. Well, there were so many people where he said that to, and they went and hit under a rock. They're like, "I can't believe that guy just talked to me that way." And so he he said that to me, and I said, "When will you?" <laughs> he goes call me tuesday there you go <laughs> so i called him tuesday and i got a date and i said go. who am i working with and he said comedian number 54 what's it matter we're selling drinks here <laughs> and so that was kind of the that's that's like the mindset of a lot of them or as long as i've got a guy talking behind the microphone that's willing to have the stage presence necessary to stand and talk behind a microphone i don't care you were living your dream and that was part of it and made the best of it i right. get it i get it you know probably that's the way it is for um bands that are touring I mean, well you they, played the drums did you ever play in a band nothing that ever did anything of significance just garage bands in high school okay when like, did you start playing the drums fifth grade fifth grade fifth grade you either had to be in choir or band okay pick one i picked band okay and i wanted to be a drummer because of the monkeys the monkeys i was even a member of the monkeys fan club were you yeah did you have the lunchbox didn't have a lunchbox but i had Thermos? a whole no i had a whole fancy portfolio glossy portfolio with pictures and really letter posters from, yeah the whole 
nine yards, probably, you know, cardboard cutout, whole, whole thing. And, um, did you sing to them? No. Were you a drummer singer? No, I was just a drummer drummer. Okay. So pick one choir or, or band. So I picked band and drums and that was probably fourth grade. And it was like wow. a bunch of drummers, clarinets, and trumpets. I think that's all it was. I mean, those are maybe flutes. I mean, that's just the, the the bare minimum of the easiest things that people could hack away at. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it was an awful sound, I'm sure. Oh, can't even imagine. <laughs> well, I can because my kids went through it too. You know, a room full of kids just hacking away at whole notes. Mary had a little lamb. Mm-hmm. And then you had to audition to get into band. Mm. And I remembered practicing on my practice pad. And, yes. And I, f- and you know, okay, it's time for your audition. And I auditioned, and you you pass. You're in band, in fifth grade band now. And so that was a big deal. Yeah. You know, accomplishment. Yeah. Uh, that drumming pad on the. Were you drumming on the bus? Probably. Yeah. Probably. I saw kids with the drumming pad drumming on the bus. Some, some kids, some of the kids that didn't make it, they, they sent them to choir. <laughs> <laughs> All these terrible musicians. Throw them a bone. You're not in choir, but oh, gosh. it was clearly one or the other. So who was the big drummer to you once you got in and you were looking at, were you thinking rock and roll the minute that you're in the fifth grade with it? No, probably not. I mean, it all be the progression was from fifth grade band and then girlfriend, middle roadie. school <laughs> <laughs> tour bus, tour bus. Yeah. <laughs> then sixth grade was middle school, so that was you know now that's the next level. Uh-huh. Um, Drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I was in that finding myself. It was pre comedy. I wanted to do comedy. I couldn't tell anybody I wanted to do comedy because I didn't want to hear the feedback from everybody saying, you can't make a living that or comedy. Yeah. I don't even think you're funny. <laughs> why, why would you, you know, all not, that. Now st- that's a good joke. <laughs> you're not even funny. You're not even funny. How are you funny? You're not funny around the house. No, I'm not funny around the house, but you're my mom. Why do I want to be funny to you? You're telling me to clean my room. What is funny in that? Now, when I shut the door, all the things I say about you are funny to me. <laughs> I promise. Or angry. Yeah. One, right. of the, one of the other. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a love-hate relationship with my parents. They split when I was in the seventh grade. I didn't even know they didn't like each other. I mean, I thought we were a big family. And all of a sudden, there's a family meeting Uh-oh. in the family room. Uh-oh. And they said, your father and I have decided we don't love each other anymore, and uh, we're going to get a divorce. Uh-oh. What? <laughs> We go on family vacations. I don't understand that. I, you don't fight. You don't. I mean, it just like hit me out of left field. And they, so they, they hit it well. They did hide it well. I think. I think my mom realized my dad had it hidden well. I yeah. don't even think she knew. Oh, you know. Mm-hmm. And so then she's like, "Well, let's go to therapy." And he's like, "I don't want your stinking therapy. I just want to." Leave. <laughs> Bye now. It's not you. It's me. You're right here we go. <laughs> right. This guy named Mark White was an accident kid you know his his brothers and sisters like he became an uncle in second grade that's how (laughs) how much of an accident he was like they were in they were married and in college and and all of a sudden mark came around and so he and i were best friends we were in the same class through all of elementary school and part of middle school like when you're changing classes we're still in the same classes together it was like this weird thing where the planets aligned and so he says to me, and and so his parents worked, and they just like, I mean, he was so far, they're, they're just like, there's food in the fridge. I mean, he was such a latchkey kid. And yeah. his dad was a dentist, and his, I think his mom was the receptionist at the dental office. So he would just come home and do whatever. And it, it didn't matter that he was six. <laughs> they, they didn't, they were so, they were so, they thought they were so done with kids. He'd be fine. Yeah, he'll be fine. Yeah. You know, what could, what kind of problems could he get into? So he's like rummaging around in his brother's rooms who are either in college or married. Right. And he comes across a George Carlin album. And so he's quoting it at school. And I'm like, and but he's doing it like it's a part of our conversation. And so he's talking about the hippy dippy weatherman. He's or just whatever. dropping stuff in. Dropping it in. Yeah, as a part of conversation. He goes, you got to come over. And I'm like, okay. So he goes into the closet and gets this album and I listen to it and just bing 
it? Glass Clown. It might have been, or that's Occupation Fool. Oh, okay. That's the, that's the green one, green cover, I think. I, I couldn't even tell you that. I just did. I, I Yeah, you did. <laughs> I mean, well, you, I don't know you if know I'm right. How do you know that? <laughs> I don't know. It's the crazy stuff that just pops That you remember? Brain, See, yeah. I can't remember algebra, but I can tell you all kinds of stupid things that don't matter. <laughs> so anyway, I um, he played Occupation Fool to me. A light turned on, and I thought, I have got to do this. I want to be a comedian. And so I studied it. Yeah, I remember when that stuff came out. It was like, it oh, couldn't get enough so of it. good. Yeah, couldn't get enough of it. And so I would listen to it. I, I would listen. There was a show called Dr. Domeno. Yeah, and I, I would to, listen I to, to it that in my, as a kid. Sunday nights. Yeah, on, when I was in like probably middle school or right. younger. Yeah. Dr. Domeno Radio Hour. Right. Yeah. And I would listen to it like, why is that funny? What makes that funny? How do you make that funny? And and studied it. And so then I started writing comedy when I was in high school. And I just kept it to myself. It was like this, I'm supposed to be doing English or algebra and I'm writing jokes instead. And, um, and so then when I got the opportunity to do it, it blindsided everybody. Like Crackers opened. I, I decided I'm going to do an open mic at Crackers. Uh, you know, I finally, it's just like, I got to do this. I can't have this pecking in my mind about you, you got to do stand up. You got to yeah. do stand up. I, mean, I, I got I have to do it. Yeah. So you do you, do you remember that first of a mic vividly? I do. Did it get recorded? I hope it didn't. Okay, there you go. Um I mean, I had this whole act written out and at the last minute I decided to tell a story instead <laughs> and it got no laughs. And then this guy heckled me in the middle of the whole no laugh five minute set <laughs> and I roasted him uh. and, and the whole, it, it got like an ovation. I think people were so feeling sorry for me because you were going that, you that were, I was eating cheese from the big wheel. The you entire were sink, thing. Sink of the ship was sinking. Oh my God. It sank. It was, I was just standing there in water up to my ankles and and he threw me a line that I could respond to and just roasted him. And that was all it took. It was like, that is what I thought comedy should be. And so from that point on then, I, I thought, okay, I can't tell stories. <laughs> okay, note to self. <laughs> right, yeah, right. The old Not storyteller. Funny. I was working a club with a friend of mine. It was in Dayton, Ohio. And at that club, they put you up in a house. And um, a lot of times it's a comedy condo. But in this case, it was a house and we were working together and I was excited to see him and we're talking and we're catching up and I hear, eh! and I said, I looked at him and I go, what is that? And he goes, I don't know. And eh! do you have clothes in the dryer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if this place has a dryer. <laughs> but do you, and he goes, "No, I don't have clothes in the dryer." <clears throat> do you have something in the oven? <laughs> and he goes, "You got something and something, <laughs> something and anything." He goes, "No, I don't. I don't have anything in the oven." <clears throat> what is that? <laughs> and so I start like walking around, and I'm I'm waiting for it to go. <clears throat> there it is, and I'm in the hallway in between the bedrooms. And there's a door there, and I open the door, and it's a closet, and there's this box up in the closet, and I said, it's coming from this box. <laughs> I think it's a doorbell. And so he goes to the front door, and there's a guy standing there. <laughs> About time. Yeah, and he never knocked. He never did anything. He just... Kept pushing the doorbell buzzer, and he said, um, "Hey, my name's Gary. I used to live in this house. Is there any mail for me?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We just got here, Gary. <laughs> we didn't even know that was a doorbell. <laughs> oh yeah, that that buzzer thing. <laughs> By the way, your clothes are dry. Exactly, and there's something <laughs> in the oven. <laughs> here in Indy, what a great place to be from doing stand up because you could develop as as a writer and as a performer in Indianapolis, and then you could drive to three hours to Columbus, Ohio, to a full week funny bone room and do eight shows. Mm -hmm. 
I supported my family developing and earning money to get to the point where I did have the time that would work on The Tonight Show or mm-hmm. on Letterman. Mm-hmm. And then you go there and you, you do your set. There, there, of course, and this happens probably more now than ever before, people come out of the womb and they're like, I should be the president. <laughs> I mean, they, they're like, what? Do time? <laughs> Develop an act? I'm already funny. I should be, I should already. Do you have seven minutes of really funny? Much? Yes, I have seven minutes. Really? Because I didn't hear anybody laughing at your set. <laughs> There was nobody laughing at your show. Did you realize that? No, I didn't realize. You're telling me that I'm not funny? I'm telling you you're not funny. I was working with Steve Harvey at a comedy club in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was owned by a guy named Kevin, and Kevin wanted desperately to be David Letterman. I mean, he really wanted it. He wanted it badly enough that he created a set and a television show, Night Shift was the name of the show. He dressed like David Letterman. I mean, to the shoes, mm. dressed like David Letterman. And so, uh, and so, you would go do a regular show on Wednesday night, and then Thursday would be an open mic show, and then you would be on Night Shift. The knockoff TV show from late night with David Letterman. And then you would do the regular rest of the week at the, at that club. And so Steve Harvey was part of the deal. You do the part of the deal was you would do his, his side show show, basically. Yeah. It's part of it. Oh, and trust me, he milked that. Like you, he wanted to pay you less because you ended up getting a TV credit. Exposure. 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 <laughs> and you got a, a tape. Of course, he charged you extra for the tape. <laughs> but you got the tape of being on the show. So you could use that to... Further your career. For, yeah, probably, yeah. At whatever <laughs> to, the or suburb... To, or to tape over it for a, a basketball game. <laughs> Well, right. you couldn't because it was it, it wasn't a VHS three tape. Three inch show. Three, what was what was the big three quarter inch probably? Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah so I couldn't I couldn't tape over. That's the that's the bad thing about. It. Not only could I not really use it to get into places, I, I, re- I also couldn't record over it. <laughs> so it was just it, it's a deteriorating tape someplace. There you go. Mike burned it. <laughs> it's in the burn barrel. <laughs> That's right. He burned it. I breathed it in, and I've I've got I've got lung cookies as a result. So, um, so we're we're sitting there. Steve Harvey at the time isn't Steve Harvey, and so he's just a schmo. He hasn't done anything yet, and I'm still a schmo, and I still haven't done anything yet. <laughs> so he he of course is like incredibly famous these days but we're sitting there and it's it's before the there's a, a dude that's going to do a guest set and he's like the doctor of comedy was what he went by and and steve harvey is like the doctor of comedy the doctor is in the house he's how what what makes you be the doctor of comedy mr doctor and he, he and so he's like bantering back and forth with this guy and this he's like have you are you a professional comedian and he's like, well i've worked with paula poundstone and insert name of other yeah name dropping n- name yeah name dropping and uh and so he's like really okay so tell me something doctor are you, are you really working with them on the road or are you doing open mics with them here at this club he's like well i'm uh, i'm doing open mics at this club with them I mean, totally found him out. Like he did, he was, he was, he had so much bravado before Steve asked him the one question that he had to be honest with. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he's just like below the a, chair that Mike's going to burn a, later. He's a mouse. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Looking for, looking for chip scraps. And so he goes up and he does his set and he's got this re- tape recorder. And, uh, and so he's like always recording his sets. So the next night he comes back and um, and it's the uh, open mic before night shift, the TV show. And he's all excited. And, and Steve Harvey's like, the doctor is back. The doctor is in the house. Hey, doctor, how's it going? You're going to do another set for us tonight? And he's like, I am. And, and he goes, and, and this time I brought a new tape recorder to record my show. And he's like, oh, good, all right. He's going to record in the show. Doctor's recording the show. And, you know, he's riffing and everything. So he goes up, 
does a set, comes back the next night because he's just like a junkie that way. And Steve sees him and, and, and he's like, so doctor, how'd the set go? Did you play the set back? Did you get the recording? And he goes, yeah, I, I, I did get the recording and I, I'm, I, I've got a faulty tape recorder. I'm going to have to take that back because it didn't work. He's like, didn't work. <laughs> what do you mean that it didn't work? And he's like, well, well, it, it, it recorded me, but it didn't record the laughs. And he's like, didn't record the laughs. You know why? And he's like, yeah, I, I think it's faulty. No, it's because you ain't funny, brother. There wasn't anybody laughing. Not one not one person laughed. It, it picked it up because there wasn't anything to pick up. Nobody was laughing. And, and I'm just sitting there like, that guy, I mean, first of all, he punches him in the gut over not really working with Paula Poundstone. <laughs> And and then he says, you ain't funny the next night. Hi, this is Andy. If you enjoyed listening to our podcast, please be sure to like and subscribe. Remember, laughter is contagious. Help us spread it by telling a friend. <laughs>